Hello, I'm Tim Paradis, a resident of Portland. I occasionally host at the Portland Media Center interviews on international topics of politics and social justice. Today I'm happy to welcome three guests who will be talking about their recent trip to the West Bank of Palestine to help Palestinian farmers with their olive harvest. Three guests, uh, I don't know if it's my left or right, but uh, Abby Fuller, closest to me, is a professor uh, in the sociology department at the University of Southern Maine, Becky Hitchcock in the middle, a retired nurse from Portland, and Abby Fuller, is, I'm sorry, and uh, Cynthia Howard at the end is a retired architect from Bitterford Pool. Prior to talking about your recent trip to Palestine, can you talk about your own personal journey to interest in the Palestinian people? Maybe we can start with you. Sure. Um, I taught college for many years at a small college in Indiana called Manchester College. And for some, uh, Manchester has a strong focus on peace and justice. And because of some sort of historical quirk, we often had um, a number of Palestinian students at Manchester College. We had a pretty large contingent of international students. Um, and a bunch of Palestinian students. So knowing them very personally um, got me interested in just learning about the conflict between Israel and Palestine. Uh, was this your first trip uh, to that part of the world? No, it wasn't. Uh, Fifteen years ago I went with a faculty trip from Manchester College to Israel and uh, Palestine. I see. So not my first. And Becky. Uh, I have had the opportunity and the luxury of traveling uh, to many different places and many of those trips have included trips with college level students and I had never been to the Middle East. I had some ideas, some rough ideas of some of the conflicts going on there, but I'd never traveled there. So when my friends talked about their travel there and how they had enjoyed it and then started talking about the olive picking, that idea appealed to me um, and I thought I'd, I'd like to do that. Thanks. And Abby? Cynthia. Oh, Cynthia. Um, well, I, two things motiv motivated me to want to go there. Um, uh, one is just being an American and looking at this sort of strange statistic as Israel being the, Israel and Saudi Arabia being the two countries that our government gives the most money to. And I said, I really want to know more about that. What is the backstory of that? And the little I started um, learning about what was happening in Palestine and the Israeli situation, it made me think very much about um, what had happened in South Africa. And I'm the mother of black children, adopted children, two of whom are Ethiopian. And so, you know, I would, I had picked up on the news over the years of how the Ethiopian Jews, who are just as legitimate Jews as Israeli Jews, were being so poorly treated by Israel. Um, they had to escape Ethiopia because they were, this was, oh, probably a couple of decades ago, they, they were being very, very badly persecuted. And I had a, um, a, a dentist who was um, a Jewish man in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who was contributing money for this effort to um, uh, help is, um, Ethiopian Jews go to what was supposed to be their homeland and then to find out how poorly treated they were. I, I wanted to know more. and. The only way I think you can really sometimes know for sure um, in a way that you can speak forcefully to others about what your beliefs are is to go and see for yourself. Um, I have been to Cuba quite a few times and as an architect and preservation planner I absolutely fell in love with the architecture. But I also fell in love with the people and it made me realize that there's so much more to know about our world than we hear in our media here in this country. And so that was, that was the motivation for me to go. And I also knew that I'd be meeting a bunch of amazing uh, people, because when you go on trips, you know, um, service trips, um, you find that the, it's a select group of people that are pretty terrific comrades. My understanding is that the Olive Harvest Tour brought together people from a number of nations and several other states among whom the 15 who came from Maine were the largest contingent. Uh, can you say something about why you think there's such a high level of interest in Palestine in Maine? And uh, did you have conversations with some of the folks from uh, overseas, from other countries, yes. and what some of their perspectives were? 
We stayed in a hotel in Bethlehem, and the group that we were all part of, and Maine was a rather large uh, uh, contingent, there were um, about a hundred of us, um, all in all. And some of those people, they were from um, several European countries, a large group from England, but Poland, Switzerland, France, Germany, uh, Holland. Um, some people go every year. They go as couples, they go as friends, they go as um, humanitarian um, groups. They're quite devoted to that. So they had friends that they'd seen from year to year. They had friends that they saw again in the um, olive fields. So um, we had a lot of opportunities to talk with them and amongst ourselves. We also had a lot of opportunities to have different presentations, films, and lectures from a number of different groups. And we were all a part of that. So uh, I feel that gave us uh, uh, opportunities to learn um, a great deal, both about the kind of people who are interested in um, helping the farmers uh, uh, make their olive harvest, but also interested in what are we doing here in Maine, or where is Maine, um, and, 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 and what kinds of things are you interested in, what are your goals, what are your objectives, why are you here? Did you get a sense of um, the level of understanding of the Palestinian cause and the type of solidarity that goes on in some of those uh, other countries? Did they speak to that at all? I think that depending on the size of their group or how involved they were in a group um, in their own communities, certainly we had opportunity to learn so much about um, uh, political uh, ideas, social ideas, civil rights issues um, from the speakers that we had. And other people would talk about their, their experience and, uh, and uh, highlight what was being offered in, um, to us um, as presentations. Okay. And Abby, what was your daily experience there? I mean, olive picking sounds either grueling or exotic, <laughs> but what, what was that experience? And, and what was a typical daily schedule? Uh, so typically we would um, go out and pick olives in the morning. Our group, since the group was so large, would usually split in two and go to two different fields. Um, we would meet the family that owned the fields. Uh, they would usually pick with us. Um, they would serve us a wonderful lunch in the fields. Um, and then the afternoons were, by and large, devoted to uh, touring different places. We went to Jerusalem. We went to Bethlehem. Um, there was a couple times when we picked olives in the afternoon, I mm -hmm. think. And then in the evenings, um, we'd go back and have a, a wonderful dinner at this hotel. And then in the evenings, there would be a speaker or a film um, at the hotel that we would watch. So the days were pretty packed, um, which was great. We, I think we all feel like we learned an enormous amount, and it was a really good mix of um, doing manual work, actually helping the farmers pick the olives, and being a sort of presence to protect them from possible harassment by settlers um, who lived around the olives fields. A good mix of that, and then also um, hearing from other people and learning things. Now, you talked about harassment from settlers. Perhaps, Cynthia, you could talk a bit about signs of the Israeli occupation uh, that you witnessed uh, on this trip? Well, um, just to back up a second, the, the fields that we went to, the groves that we went to, were specifically chosen because they were suffering harassment from the settlers who are, these are communities that are on stolen Palestinian land, and um, they set up barricades around it and very often, in some cases, um, prevent Palestinians to go to their own lands where their their groves are, and this is their source of income. So they limit them to, um, with Israeli permission, they are graciously allowing them maybe two times a year to go onto their lands to care for their olives, which pretty much restricts them from doing the kind of care of their own resource that they would under normal circumstances, because the olive trees do need more than two times a year care, so they get weedy and stuff. But they. Um, it gives them a little bit of a measure of safety because international presence of you know people who will go back and talk about what's happening to the Palestinians would be less likely to be assaulted by s settlers. Um, but these are the most vulnerable groves that, that we've been assigned to. And on the way, you know, we, we could see many demolished homes because we're moving through Area C which is Palestinian, but is completely controlled by Israel. And it's pretty depressing and very, very powerful to see 
you know, upfront and personally, the community and the um, constraints that the is Palestinian families have to live with. And um, if they own their own house and they're living in their own house and if it needs a toilet repaired, they have to appeal to the Israeli government for a permit to do anything at all to their own property. And only like 1% or th maximum 3% of Palestinian permits for building improvements are ever approved by the Israelis. Whereas, you know, Israeli improvements are like that. And, and the people, the settlers who are usually squatting on the land, which is stolen Palestinian land, turn around and ask the Israelis for permits to extend it and make it a permanent recognized settlement, and they get permits all the time. So the injustice is really stark and overwhelming. And to just take a little switch here, one of the things I think we were all stepping back from the experience, I know sharing with other members of the group, one of the most amazing things is when you realize the constraint on normal life that they live with daily. Um, they are the most generous, most welcoming, you know, very, very well educated. Because you know, if you consider all the ways they're limited in living a full life, they treasure their children and they treasure education. And, and they also treasure their heritage. I mean, Palestine, as an architectural preservationist, one of the things that just blew me away and, and broke my heart in reading more deeply prior to this trip was that in 48, the Nakba, which is the name of the, the disaster when you know, the Israelis you know, basically attacked the Palestinians, took their land, there were 583 Palestinian villages that were ultimately obliterated, gone. Every remnant of that history, that culture, their heritage has been totally obliterated. And even names of places have been changed to make them respond to the Jewish biblical story that they have for themselves in, in Israel. But they've wiped the Palestinians' heritage off the map. And you know, I, when I go to other places, one of the things is, as an architect, and a preservationist and loves old buildings is, is to just go see the physical evidence of a culture because it tells you so much about the diversity of our planet and our people. And it's gone. It's completely gone. I mean, there's a little bit left in East Jerusalem. I mean, there's some older houses, but it's just tragic. And for them to somehow remain strong and go on, it's you, it just makes you want to do something to make their story more widely, widely known, because it's such an injustice. And I'm hogging the conversation, but well, opening up all sorts of routes for uh, further conversation. In what ways did you see the Palestinian culture and identity still being nurtured? Well, my day always started, my roommate and I didn't use the air conditioning in our um, hotel room. We had the windows open. It was lovely having the breeze come in, and every morning as the sun was um, coming up, we could hear the call to prayer um, throughout mm -hmm. the town of uh, Bethlehem, and it was beautiful. And some mornings we would just get up and look out the window, so the sun was just rising over the tops of those houses that she was describing. And it was really very peaceful and very beautiful. Um, and you notice that the things are congested and close together, but you start to he hear the, the people coming out, and you hear them singing and talking, and you can hear the birds, and you, s you, know, you look out, and some of them have um, gardens with greenery. So it was just such a peaceful way uh, to start the day. Then we'd go and have breakfast, um, which was somewhat different from the kinds of traditional breakfast foods that we would have here. And we'd talk with those people we were talking about earlier. And then we'd gather the ladders, we'd gather the, the, um, the blankets that go under the trees. And I just was thinking, that's how they've picked olives for thousands yeah. of years. Um, and our hotel was just about two blocks away from a place called Shepherd's Field, where the angel uh, appears before the shepherds, uh, telling them of the birth of Christ. So you're just thinking, this place is ancient, 
and so much history is here. So much has happened um, to all of these mm -hmm. people. The people, the Palestinian people that we met were so gracious. They were so happy to see us. And one of the things that you, you learn right away when you go to the olive groves is, uh, well, they receive you so warmly. They're so welcoming and ha happy to see you. And I always thought you just kind of plucked olives um, yeah. off a branch. Um, but you don't. They kind of hang down in a stream, and you just like pull them down very gently. Um, uh, and the rest of the place is dry. It's arid. So your eyes are dry, your nose is dry, but your hands are all moist from picking the, um, the olives. And the farmers and their families were so gracious to us. We'd be picking. Many of them, most of them don't speak English, but they knew three or four words like thank you or welcome or happy he you're here. Um, and they would bring us little cups of coffee um, as we were picking, um, picking the olives. So um, uh, it, it was just very, very gracious. They were very kind to us. They were very um, compassionate. And that, that atmosphere that you feel among the Palestinian people is so different from what you could feel if you saw only the walls um, or only the, the, uh, the fences. Um, and people, my own family was very concerned about me going. Some of my family members didn't want me to go because they said, you're going to be in danger. Um, and I didn't feel in danger any time, not for one second, not for one minute, any time of the day or night when we were doing things um, amongst ourselves, um, out on the streets, um, and with the Palestinian um, uh, people. So um, that's kind of a, another side from some of the political strife. But with, with, within and, and among the, the people, they're always faced um, with the boundaries and what they can't do and what they're, what they're limited in doing, uh, what's imposed on them. But they're still so very gracious and they're hopeful um, and they're kind. And they were kind, um, kind to us. They were eager to see us, eager to talk with us. Now, Cynthia talked about, uh, or you both have, destruction of Palestinian culture, harassment, and land theft by the settlers. Who are the settlers, and what is motivating them? The settlers are um, uh, Jews, usually, who have come from other countries. We learned that there were a lot of um, immigrants from uh, Russia, for example, who are coming in and are attracted to the settlements because they're highly subsidized by the Israeli government. So if you don't have a lot of resources, you can go and live in one of these settlements and have a pretty nice apartment, um, a good education, um, good you know, uh, amenities like you know, playgrounds and pools and things like that. Um, so my understanding is that they're more often um, Jews who are coming from other parts of the world, there are a lot of American Jews as well, who partly for religious reasons and partly just for economic reasons are going to uh, live in these settlements and to populate the settlements. And one thing that I found very interesting was the size and number of the settlements this time compared to when I was there 15 years ago. When I was there 15 years ago, they you know, sort of dotted the hillside, and now they're like these huge sort of suburban developments um, that you see. They're just enormous and growing. Um, and this is all on Palestinian land. We actually saw the beginnings of a settlement um, one day when we were picking in an olive field next to uh, what's called an outpost. Oftentimes the settlements begin by um, a Jewish family or a couple families maybe going in and taking a piece of land, again it's Palestinian land, and just erecting kind of a temporary shelter there. You know, this one was almost like covered with plastic. There wasn't very much there. They just start building. Um, and that's illegal, even under Israeli law. But eventually enough people go that a settlement begins and it becomes sort of a de facto recognized by Israel and then starts to get subsidized by the government. Um, so it was interesting to see that process start. And the Palestinians can't do anything about it. You know, it's on their land, it's right next to their um, uh, olive fields, and there's nothing that they can do to stop it. And did you see examples of collaboration between the Israeli army and the settlements in terms of permitting and uh, moving those settlements forward to final recognition? Well, the settlements always were fenced in and, uh, you know, heavily guarded. There was always a military presence around the settlements protecting the settlers, you know. I mean, there was really, you couldn't, you couldn't just drive in there, certainly if you were Palestinians, Palestinians, so they're heavily protected. That was, I think, the main thing that we saw. 
So as Palestinian territory becomes more and more limited exactly. with settlement increase. It's a purposeful um, it's, you know, effort on the Israeli government's part. To, it's a method for them to s steal the land and make it impossible to reverse the situation. And did you get a sense from the Palestinians that you talked to that there is a hopelessness about the prospects for an independent Palestinian state? And if not that, what in their view? Well, that's, I think, what I was kind of alluding to earlier about the astonishing uh, uh, humanity and graciousness and sense of peace in some way, despite, I mean, I think, for one thing, they can, there's nothing they can do. And if you went around with rage about that all the time, it would undo your own humanity. That's basically the way I see the way they have created this sense of, you know, not completely despair that nothing can happen, but they know that they're doing what they can do and that they are in the right and, and they have no control over what's going to come down the pike. And basically, our voices, people who are from outside who can put pressure on our government, after all, we give them 10 million to 15 million dollars every day of our money. And what are they doing with it? Well, as an American, it makes me outraged. They're building these beautiful new road systems, but they connect settlement to illegal settlement to illegal settlement, and they cut uh, Palestinians off sometimes from their own farmlands, but it make it difficult for, the, for them, in many cases, to go see relatives even, because they're not allowed to use these roads. In Israel, there, you have different license plates for Palestinians and Israelis. And so they're really, it's like Bantu, Bantus in South Africa. They're, they're kind of drawing in restrictions around individual small Palestinian land and mystacit, mystacitizing. Okay. And I think because of that, them. there there seem to be a pretty widespread recognition that a two-state solution isn't feasible anymore. They've made it infeasible. That, it, that it, it's got to be um, one state. But the problem is, if it's one state with equality for um, both Arabs oh. and Jews, then it's no longer a Jewish state. Um, so who knows what's going to happen from now on. Someone said to me, or maybe it was said to the group, it's illegal to be angry. So it's hard for them to show um, signs of anger, such as with a peaceful demonstration, um, because they can be further oppressed or they could be um, targeted. So it's difficult for them to express their views, uh, perhaps publicly or in a way that a, a, a television station, for example, would pick up and, 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 and send to other parts of the world. So they have to be very, uh, very careful. Um, I think within the, those constraints, there's also a strong will to carry on life. We went to a, a place out in the desert and met uh, some Bedouin nomads. And they live very, very simply, simply and their uh, wealth is measured in terms of the number of goats that they have. And historically, they've gone from a place to place in the desert um, and grazed with their um, goats. They have a more permanent settlement where they are now, which is literally uh, on the edge of a, a very beautiful um, Israeli uh, Jewish uh, settlement. They're quite limited in what they can do. Their children had to walk on a major highway for miles to go to school, so, and some of the children had been injured, so they decided to build their own school. And they built it um, because they were um, also limited in the tools they could use or the supplies that they could have access to to build what you would think of as a usual school building. So they built it out of tires. They stacked tires. They filled the centers of those um, uh, tires with sand. And then they made sand um, and baked it in the sun as the outside walls. And the children walk um, there uh, every day to school. It's just a matter of you know, a very short distance. But that really impressed me because I thought they want, um, they want an, an, what people would call a normal life, a place to live, to feel secure, to have their children be safe, to have their children to have access um, to a school. Uh, they had playground material donated for the children at, at that school. And they weren't allowed to uh, assemble um, the playground because they weren't, again, allowed access to some of the nuts and screws and bolts that would be required to put those things together because those could be potentially used um, as weapons. So I think it's, it can, it's difficult for them in, in many ways. And it's a daily confrontation. Um, we, we met at one of the olive groves, a farmer who this particular grove was the largest that uh, we had access to. 
And all 100 of us went there to, to pick that day. And this farmer, through our interpreter, said that those groves have been in his family for five generations. He doesn't have a land title like we would have uh, a written proof title of that land. So he's afraid of it always uh, being um, taken away or him, ha his, him being uh, blocked from going to his, um, gr his olive groves when it's time to harvest. The trees in that grove have been verified to be 2,000 years old. One of those trees, it's a huge, huge tree. I never saw a tree that big in my whole life. It's been uh, verified by three experts from three countries to be 5,000 years old. That man loves that tree and that grove. Every night he sits in a chair under it um, to protect it. Doesn't have any weapon, doesn't have anything except his presence to protect that tree. But that's how close he feels to his land and that's how much he loves it. We've only got a couple minutes left. Um, so to bring it to the U.S as the strategic ally of Israel. What needs to change here and what do you think the prospects for change are without change here, status quo? Well, the U.S., activists in the U.S. need to um, get the U.S. government to stop giving so much money to Israel um, or to condition aid to Israel on stopping the settlements, dismantling the settlements, all that sort of thing. Um, Israel couldn't do what it's doing without U.S. funding. So that's a really important point of leverage. And we, as citizens, we feel, you know, have a responsibility for how our government spends money. So that's sort of, uh, I think, the main thing that Americans can do. Well, think, another thing that's really important right now is BDS. Because, you know, all BDS of the... BDS being boycott, boycott, divest, and divest, sanction. Boycott, divest, and sanction. And which is a movement similar to what changed well, uh, South the Africa. situation in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Right. And th y you hear about it in the news only in terms of, of, of the government and individual states trying to... Well, the, basically, the Republican legislators wanting to write rules that say that um, you can be... We as Americans can be sanctioned and hurt for supporting it. Um, students in college that are part of our effort that are supporting BDS have been received backlash because there are efforts to prevent students from being able to receive um, federal um, loans for their education if they happen to voice a concern about what's happening in Palestine and support you know this peaceful effort it's an economic peaceful effort so we need to um, we need to speak against that and try to keep our right to participate and dis discuss it. I mean, that's, that's free speech. Mm -hmm. We believe in free speech. Oh, yeah. So to, to claim that BTS is, is not just free speech and nonviolent, we've got to address and that, that. And also that it's not anti-Semitic. Right. Uh, absolutely. One of the main um, ways that BDS has been targeted by opponents is by claiming that it's anti-Semitic. If, essentially, if you criticize Israel, you're criticizing Jews. And we, none of us feel that way. You know, uh, the state of Israel is different than the Jewish people, and it's perfectly legitimate to criticize a state government for what it's doing. And I think where there's conflict, there needs to be change. And change can be difficult, and there can be a lot of, of barricades to change. But um, I was thinking the other day, sometimes one of the barriers to change are our own ideas uh, or what we believe. Uh, so I think it's important to be able to um, know where your ideas come from, um, to know facts about and information about um, an issue, to listen to other people, to talk to other people. And I was reminded of something yesterday at the Martin Luther King breakfast. There's, there was a young um, African-American student from Deering High School, and he was reminding us to involve youth. They are our next generation, um, and we, it, we need to talk and to listen to them, include them um, as well. So on that positive note, I haven't quite mastered the hand signals from the cameraman yet. I think we're, we're out of time. <laughs> I really appreciate the spirit of discussion here. You actually led yourselves and uh, answered questions I hadn't thought of asking. So very much appreciated. Sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Tim.